Fast 9 is here. After a pandemic, countless delays, and a lot of hype, we're coming to the end of the most epic gas field saga of explosions in cinema history. And by now, you've seen the trailer. You've got your midnight screening tickets, and you just want to see that rocket powered Fiero fly. But how much did it all cost? What would you have to spend to own one of these cars in your garage? And which car cost the production team the most money? Well, hmm, let's just say. More than you can afford, pal. What's up, fast friends? I'm Danger, and this is Ideal Cars, and it is that time again. So let's run down the costs of the insane cars in the latest installment of the Fast and Furious franchise. And of course, add it all up and see what they spent. Are you ready? Well, buckle up. Let's go. When we filmed this, we only had rumors and trailers to work off of, since the movie, well, isn't even out yet. But we just couldn't wait. So we're making this video now because, well, we're really excited, aren't you? Especially since the trailer opens with an old friend. Yep, it just seems to me that Brian's GTR is making a comeback. And I gotta admit that this is an interesting one because we don't know who the driver actually is or how the car even fits into the plot but it's pretty unmistakably the same blue GTR we've seen in other Fast movies. And honestly, why wouldn't they want that car to get as much screen time as possible? I don't believe that you can even have a Fast and Furious movie without at least one or two R34s. The GTR is basically the way that the producers keep Paul Walker's spirit alive in the films. And as far as price goes, we actually have a really good idea of what that specific R34 costs because, well, we already talked about it right here. And it went for a whopping $1.37 million, which doesn't make it the first, but the second most expensive car on this list, believe it or not. And the most expensive car, uh, well, we see in the trailer, even if it's not Paul's actual car, the seven figure superstar. But you can bet that a clean hero ready R34 GTR costs between 80 and 150 grand if you look at prices in Japan, which if you think about it, it's actually kind of affordable for the car of your dreams. Now, if you're in the States, the R34 isn't legal yet. Well, unless it's a Motorex, but that's another story for another day. So maybe check out the legal to import R32 instead. Then you can still have that legendary Godzilla experience for one tenth or even a hundredth of the price. But the Skyline isn't the only thing in the establishing shot though. There's also a 240Z, a Ford Fairlane, and a new Challenger. Now, as far as the establishing shot, we don't know about any of the drivers of the trio of cars, but we do know that they're important enough to get valuable screen time in the trailer. And who can resist mentioning an old Datsun? Today, a super clean 240Z will run you about 30 grand. As for a Fairlane, well, those are slightly less desirable than other cars in that era. So 20 grand will find you a pretty good example. And finally, there's a classic Mopar Orange Dodge Demon, a car that you can get for 90 grand if you're lucky. Which brings us to a total of over $1.5 million in cars if you include the GTR. Yeah, the fam has come a long way. However, the GTR isn't the only recurring hero in the series, and you better believe that Dom's blown charger RT makes the cameo. Well, actually, the trailer is absolutely loaded with chargers. And so, uh, yeah, I have a feeling that I uh, know who helped pay for the advertising, but none of them are as iconic as the black 1970 Charger RT. With that giant supercharger poking out of the engine bay, it's hard not to love this piece of good old American iron. And well, it can be yours for a measly 70,000 bucks if you wanna do all the motor work yourself. Not bad, all things considered, especially when a collector appraised the same car from the first movie at over 200K, yikes. You could get like, tree? Yeah, three new Hellcats for that price? I'd probably still get the 70 Charger, but when we're speaking about Charger Hellcat wide bodies, we get to see one being driven by Dom in an off-road race against John Cena. And if you're enjoying this video so far, go hit the like button. And also if you wanna snag some new ideal tees, check them out up here. Because we know John Cena would probably rep one of these and we all do know that Hellcats are sweet and it makes sense that someone who loves muscle would gravitate towards an SRT wide body offering from Chrysler. And the good news is that this is one of the more obtainable cars that we see, since you can just go and pick one up from the dealer, sure. Yeah, it is 80 grand, but compared to a lot of the custom or rare cars on this list, it's pretty much a steal. 
Now, if you were paying attention, you might have seen the legend John Cena driving another muscly muscle car. And that American icon is the Ford Mustang GT350, one of my all time favorites. Right out of the gate, this car has some serious screen presence with the beautiful shot of it flying through the air about to be grabbed by a jet. You know, because it wouldn't be a modern fast movie without the over the top absurdity just like the GT350, which is the result of taking the already great Coyote Mustang and cranking it up to uh, 11 in order to create a car that not only can hang with a Hellcat in the quarter mile, but can also dominate in the twisties with the fully upgradable independent suspension. Yeah, Dom's gonna have to work that charger hard, real hard. And they cost about the same at 80,000 bucks. So. Which one would you pick? Because as cool as the Charger Hellcat and the 1970 Charger are, those might not be the coolest chargers in the movie. Because, well, of a custom built mid-engine Charger 500 built specifically for Mr. Diesel himself. The outside of the car, it looks great. I mean, how could you not love a 68 Charger? But it's what's hiding under the beautiful American shell that sets this car apart. First, it's not powered by a carbureted big block like the original RT. Instead, it's powered by a tuned Hellcat motor making, if I'm uh, reading my notes correctly, a mega ton of power. Say what? Yes, a mega ton. And that motor is located in the mid of the car. Meaning that unlike the Challenger Hellcat, this Charger 500 can make a serious claim about being a, well, quote unquote, supercar. And that all comes in for the cool low price of one million dollars. It better be all that and more. And let's go from an awesome high to a crazy low. Because we see briefly while the 68 Charger is on screen, what appears to be a completely stock uh, Toyota 86. Yeah, how did, how did this sneak into the movie? And really, there's nothing much to say about it. It appears on screen just to be pulled through a building. And you can pick up one of the twins for 15 grand all day, every day. And okay, the 86, it is a cool car for us normal people, but it's definitely not the Toyota that we all wanna see in the Fast franchise. No, that slot is reserved for the car that arguably made the franchise famous or the car the franchise made famous. And we can argue all day whether or not it's really just a BMW with a Toyota badge. Because, well, either way, the Supra's appearance isn't amazing because it's a Supra, it's amazing because, well, who's driving it? Yeah, that's right. Apparently everyone's favorite gas heist frontman and Yakuza enemy, Han, is back. With a 2020 Supra painted as a tribute to the epic Veilside RX-7. And compared to the other cars in this list, a Supra isn't very interesting. And with the price of just 50K, it doesn't even scratch the top 10 for cost, but it's Han, one of the coolest fast characters ever. So guess what? I'm stoked. And in the same vein of cars that really aren't all that impressive, we do see Letty driving a 74 Nova SS, but who am I to judge? Maybe she just likes them because they're really cheap. Because well, even a well-sorted one can be found for less than 28K which is a heck of a lot cheaper than a well-sorted Charger from the same era. And speaking of Mopar, you know that the Fast franchise can't stay away from them. And there are two great high-powered Jeeps that grace us with their presence. And we're first starting with the Jeep Cherokee Trackhawk, driven by Tej. And without a doubt, the Trackhawk is one of the most insane SUVs ever created. It can do zero to 60 in just 3.5 seconds because of 707 blown horses. Sadly, all that fire is wrapped in a Jeep Cherokee, and I wish they would have put that motor into a Wrangler, but I can absolutely respect them. And if you'd want one, just be prepared to shell out $88,000 redos, because that's how much they go for today. So the first one is a fire breather, and the second Jeep, which you may or may not understand, is driven by a longtime family member, Roman, who opted for a serious off-road monster instead of some fire-spitting roadster this time around. And this truck, it's way more my style, even though we only see it briefly. We do get to see that it seems completely decked out for overlanding, just like Tina. Which means we can actually say that the cost of this vehicle is about 50 grand, add in another like 10 or 15 grand for all the overlanding gear, and ow, for the sake of simplicity, let's just call it an even 60 which really is pretty reasonable when you compare it against insane supercars. You know, like the Noble M600, which we see in glorious royal purple driven by mommy. And well, ladies and gentlemen, this car is meant to take on legends like the McLaren F1, 
and by all accounts, it succeeded. The Noble can rocket to 225 miles per hour. And you know that if they have a supercar on screen, it's about to get real, along with its real price tag. Uh, because get this, $300,000. That's a lot of money for a car from a maker of cars that, well, like to catch on fire. And I don't know though. Do you think that we should have an ideal supercar? Should it be a Noble M600 or should it be a jet powered Fiera? Please tell me that's not a Pontiac Fiera strapped to a rocket engine. Impressive, I know. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at a loss of words for this one. I, I wanna believe that I'm, I'm in on the joke. Like, haha, it's a Fiero. Only a huge egghead would think of using one of these for anything. But honestly, I wouldn't want them ruining any other car like that. Whatever the motivation, this is probably the one car in the trailer that got the most hype. As for the price, well, who knows? A rocket-powered Volkswagen Beetle sold for 550,000 bucks, and I honestly don't know if a 2.0 Beetle is uglier than a Fiero, but we'll just pretend it costs about the same. And we're gonna have to stretch and pretend for the next two custom rides as well. Although, unlike a rocket-powered Fiero, I could see myself behind the wheel of a badass military vehicle, like the STC Delta DeJore. And if you strip away the armor and the guns, the DeJore is just a Ford F550 Super Duty with a V8 turbo diesel. However, they can be decked out for doing all sorts of jobs, including medevac, infrared scanning, troop transportation, and light assault. It's hard to know exactly which configuration they used in the movie, and militaries, well, they aren't exactly known for being open and honest about how much their tanks cost. But competing vehicles like the Oshkosh MATV run about 500K. So we can guess that the STC is probably priced pretty similar. As for the Armadillo though, which is the name of that armored land train we've seen in numerous shots is really anyone's guess. The front of the Armadillo is a Unimog. If you haven't heard of a Unimog, just picture the most hardcore off-road vehicle you can, and then just kind of make it an RV. Those big trucks sell used for roughly 350,000 bucks. The rest of the Armadillo seems to be heavily inspired by the Sherp Arc, which is likely to be a $100,000 add-on to the Sherp. And there's two of them. So best guess for the Armadillo, say uh, 550,000 bucks. And that's it for all the cars that appear in the trailers, bringing the price to own all the cars in the promos to a whopping, get ready for it, $4.851 million. But we're not quite done yet because there are plenty of leaks and rumors about the cars that aren't in the trailers. And honestly, some of the more exciting cars are hidden in those whispers, including a Jaguar and a car that only has 10 models ever produced. But let's start with the cheapest car on the list, a Fox Body Mustang. Woo-hoo, yeah. Yes, there's an early 90s Mustang on the roster, driven by a young Cena Toretto, which in a world where a nitrous-filled Eclipse is a starter car, it's kinda a bore. You can pick them up for five grand all day. And the other young Toretto clearly has better taste because he's assigned a 1965 Charger. Another Charger? That brings us to like uh, a, a lot of them. 65 is a desirable year though, so hopefully Dom held on to it because nowadays they can fetch 43 stacks easy, which isn't bad. But nothing compared to the final Charger on the list. Yeah, there is one more. It's a 70 Tantrum Charger from Fast 7. The Tantrum tuned 70 Charger is special. It's got a 1650 horsepower 9 liter V8 under the hood, which is huge, mounted to a six speed manual. Like, damn, that is a resto mod done right. <laughs> I'll take one or, or two, just not that one, since it's not for sale and there's no plans for them selling it. However, similar resto mods go for around 200 grand. So there is hope. There isn't hope of me ever owning the next car though, which is apparently one of only 10 in existence. It's called the Apollo IE. And I'll admit, I don't know much about it, other than it's supposed to be one of the fastest cars ever built, and it looks like it. Yeah, it does look like it would be worth $2.67 million. And it's powered by the legendary Mercedes 6.3 liter V12. And yes, I have no idea what it's gonna do in the movie, but Car and Driver insists there's one in it, making it easily the most expensive vehicle on the list. And since there's no real way to follow that up, the next car is an Acura NSX. And I think you probably agree the second gen NSX is pretty polarizing. 
they aren't exactly fast, they are pretty expensive, and they really failed up to live to all the hype. You can have one for 140 grand if you want. Me, I'd rather have the last car on our list, which is made surprisingly enough by Jaguar. It's called the Jaguar XESV Project 8, and it's legitimately one of my favorite cars. Not only is it the most powerful car Jaguar has ever produced, but it eats every other sedan on earth for lunch. That's right, a blue four-door with a kitty drone on the side? Yeah, the ultimate sleeper. It's the fastest sedan to ever set a time on the ring. Too bad it costs 200 grand, otherwise it would be hard to not go buy one. But then again, that's only $50,000 a door. So maybe in the meantime, I'll get the ideal F-type to hold me over. So that brings the total cost of the yet to be seen cars to 3.258 million, which is seriously a chunk of change. But it's not until you add it to the stuff that we do see that you really get an idea of the scope. To build up some anticipation, the cost for all the cars in Tokyo Drift was somewhere in the neighborhood of $1 million. That's it a measly one mil. But for Fast 9, we calculated it out to be more than $8.1 million in cars, which is eight times the total cost of Tokyo Drift. So I don't know about you, but that makes me amped. So are you excited to see the movie or have you watched the movie already? Either way, let us know what you think down below and tell us what your favorite car is in the movie. Heck, in all of the movies. And as always, this has been Bradalicious, so don't forget to like and subscribe if you're new here. And as always, keep living the ideal lifestyle.